Good morning, everybody. Paul here coming at you with a crypto coffee update, which you may well know by now can includes but is not limited to all of the news, conferences, events and happenings in the crypto space as it pertains to the exciting new world of digital finance. And of course, to encapsulate all of these lovely th happenings in the space, we do have our simultaneous sip, which is just a sip of coffee, tea or water, whatever you have on hand to start off the episode right in solidarity. So join me. Ah, awesome stuff. All right, guys. So what we have open today is Cryptide.cc, the lovely website of Cryptide. Here you can see all of the Crypto Coffee update videos and more, along with all of the news that are is contained therein in the Crypto Coffee vids, plus even more that I happen to peruse throughout the day as I'm checking out this information. And in the blog section, we primarily have next week's crypto, which is a collection of crypto conferences happening all around the world and perhaps even in your local area that you can check out if you so choose. All right. Now on to your featured scheduled programming, which is CME saying that they have hit a record number of Bitcoin futures contracts, a total of $360 million of volume. This is corresponding to roughly 18,000 different contracts or 91,000 BTC, as said, $360 million. I want to give a shout out to the author Toju Ametorua. Uh, he did a great job writing this article, very informative. I really like the TLDR here. And it's coming out of Crypto Potato, which really has the cutest little icon of any anything in crypto that I've seen thus far. A little mustachio tater going on. Uh, so essentially, suffice to say that this does not actually reflect real volume in Bitcoin, since these are indeed futures contracts from CME. And realistically, this is settled in fiat currency, primarily the US dollar or any associated fiat currency in which the contracts are settled or could be settled, not in BTC. That is going to be left to backed, an entity that is owned by the Intercontinental uh, Inter Continental Exchange that is not yet launched. They are slated to launch Q1 of this year, 2019, and they will be settling futures contracts in Bitcoin. But for the time being, this $360 million in volume is indeed just that dollar volume. However, this does bode well for institutional interest and investment into the space. After all, these derivative markets often offer some fantastic insights into what the reasonable price discovery of the underlying asset should be, considering that these markets um, offer exposure to these assets without having to directly dip one's toes into the ecosystem, so to say. So it is kind of a good barometer to gauge the relative interest of institutional investors. So seeing that this number has skyrocketed to a record high means that perhaps while this bear market isn't over, it definitely means that there is growing interest in the space, especially as to how to get one's hands on exposure, if not directly into the crypto space as a large, uh, like large wealth individual or um, large institution uh, that wants to gain exposure to the underlying asset. So interesting stuff there. I like this part as well. It talks about how future traders kind of see the market going up and down and you can see the uh, kind of short term percentages here. Um, as said, this is a really good barometer to get an idea as to what uh, fair fair market value is for the asset, even though discovery is still ongoing. Uh, really interesting stuff to see. Also, the World Economic Forum's Sheila Warren had a really interesting piece talking about um, smart contracts and their implications and specifically that they will not upend the legal sector, which is a sentiment that I have to echo for very various reasons that we'll get into momentarily, but before we jump into the legal implications of smart contracts, let's talk a little bit about CBDCs, or central bank digital currencies, which we've talked about previously on this channel. Here's a quote from Ms. Warren, quote, we are actively tracking CBDC experiments worldwide. We have painstakingly created a trusted community of approximately 40 central banks from throughout the world, including frontier and G7 economies, so small emerging markets and leading world economies, that are sharing learnings and findings, and we will shortly be issuing a white paper related to this work. So a white paper that is an aggregate uh, take from all of these central banks as to how they might best want to implement these central bank digital currencies using uh, distributed or decentralized ledger technology. Threshold issues include know your customer and anti-money laundering requirements, no big surprise there. However, I think the big surprise is exactly this, that so many central banks around the world are legitimately looking at this technology. I wanted to bring up a fantastic interview from Anthony Pompliano, or Pomp, love the dude, he's he's really great, his off-the-chain podcast is fantastic, absolutely go check this out when you have time, has some really hard-hitting, uh, top-tier guests that offer some great insights into the space, and Pomp himself is just a fantastic figure, dude has so much life about him. Um, really just a great person. I'm super glad we have him in a space. He talked to this gentleman, Jesse Lund, who works for IBM, uh, works very closely with IBM and blockchain projects, specifically heads up a lot of that stuff. 
And when asked by Anthony Pompliano about an unpopular opinion or an opinion perhaps that many people in the space don't hold as well, uh, Jesse Lund was offered a very interesting uh, point. He said, I believe that we are much closer to a central bank digital currency issuance than many individuals in the crypto space seem to think themselves. Uh, so that is particularly interesting since, th as said, this individual works with IBM very closely, works with blockchain technology, and assumingly in such a high caliber position would in turn be privy to information as to the general time frame and expectations of these larger central banks, especially given IBM is such a technological giant in, uh, in the world stage, uh, they would be privy to some elements of information, but maybe not all. Uh, this leads me to believe that perhaps a retail central bank digital currency may very well be closer than we imagine most of the time. Uh, just for those at home, just to offer some uh, clarification, there are two types of CBDCs or central bank digital currencies. There is the retail CBDC. Now a retail CBDC is just that, is for retail purposes only between large financial institutions. So let's say for example, the Federal Reserve, which is the central bank of the United States, and maybe JP Morgan Chase, uh, Wachovia, which no longer exists, is now bank of a, now what is it? Wells Fargo, um, Bank of America, these large institutions will ultimately uh, be utilizing these CBDCs amongst themselves to uh, ease liquidity burdens and settle transactions proving finality. Now, the other type of CBDC is a wholesale CBDC. A wholesale CBDC is a bit further off down the road. It would allow individuals, citizens such as you and I, to use this CBDC for everyday payments, either at the bank or perhaps even in retail markets, hence the term um, wholesale. It's for everybody, it's a wholesale CBDC for everyone involved. Now, that's, as said, that's further away. Really, we're talking about the retail CBDC for banks only. However, even that kind of implementation would be a just lightning leap forward for banks, considering that JP Morgan recently released their JP Morgan coin, uh, which is proving in the marketplace that this is a beneficial mechanism for uh, tracking and settling liquidity and payments all around the world. After all, they settle $6 trillion worth of volume daily, huge, huge market. So it makes, it makes sense that central banks as well would be looking at this kind of technology to help to ease their burdens that they have to take on um, as these particularly uh, cumbersome behemoth entities that help to guide the world economy. Now, so moving on, talking about uh, Mrs. Warren here, she mentioned as well that blockchain has some great use cases in supply chain, ID verification, and document authentication. And here is a quote from Ms. Warren, quote, our goal is to focus on the development of policy that can shepherd responsible use of DLT, mitigating risks while amplifying opportunities. Makes sense as authorities. In many cases, the technical build itself is not hugely complicated. It's consideration of the accompanying policies that serve as the barrier to wider adoption. And that, can, that makes reasonable sense. In addition, as a truly neutral and objective participant in the ecosystem, the forum can't uh, can help bridge gaps in understanding that can pave the way to broader comfort, which can lead to adoption by larger players, such as governments or entire sectors. And again, that makes sense. I'd have to take a bit of contention with someone being truly neutral and objective. I don't believe true neutrality and objectivity is possible since everyone is to some degree a self-interested economic actor. However, this does, as said, make reasonable sense um, in the context of the authority of states and uh, larger economic actors. Uh, however, to kind of shift the... Um, kind of shift the narrative to upending the legal sector, uh, that's definitely something, as I said, I can agree with, considering that generally uh, legal disputes arise out of discrepancies between understanding between parties, meaning that while the contract lays out specific clauses um, and implications, the ultimate reality of those implications are ultimately um, different between the perspectives of the two parties that are concerned, or more parties, in the contract, meaning that there's some kind of interpretative element needed therein. So to say that smart contracts will explicitly upend the legal sector perhaps is a bit foolhardy considering that even the best smart contracts perhaps have some levels of uh, mutual understanding or implication that ultimately could lead to some level of discrepancy therein. While smart contracts may easily cut down on the amount of paperwork um, and the time it takes to engage in legal agreements, ultimately these discrepancies, when they inevitably arise, even if there are far less of them, will need some kind of mediation, whether that be through um, international dispute resolution organizations that are voluntarily undertaken or through the uh, authority of the state itself and jurisdiction in which the contract was issued. That seems to be what Mrs. Sheila is thinking, uh, considering that she mentioned that the, the World Economic Forum is more of an objective entity. So assumingly, she could see the World Economic Forum and the various states it represents filling such a role. 
So very interesting stuff there, and just a slight nuanced difference as to how the legal framework, uh, legal frameworks really, of the world may be impacted by these smart contracts, and as well some information about central bank digital currencies and the differences therein, and potential implications, maybe even soon, that we can see coming down the pipe. Hopefully this could be informative for you all, and get you up to speed a bit onto how the world's governments and banks are beginning to view this exciting new technology. Now, speaking of large institutions, Microsoft wants to help you make your ICO successful. Now, I know it's not the crazy bull market of 2017, so you're probably thinking, Paul, come on, it's all about security tokens offerings now. And that may be the case, but if you're still looking for an ICO, the main thing you want to do is be regulatory compliant. And Microsoft, you know, what better entity, maybe other than the government, to help out with that? Keep in mind, last Crypto Coffee update, we talked about Gladius token. They raised tens of millions of dollars, reported to the SEC, and lo and behold, because they didn't have a working network and were going to use the funds to build said network, they counted as a security. Now, because they self-reported, the SEC was kind enough to say we're not levying any charges or fines against you. You just need to go through the process of refunding the money, filing as a security, and just continuing from that point. However, while this is definitely perhaps a blow to the perception of Gladius as a project, it is maybe even doubly so a blow to morale, considering that many of these individual investors maybe weren't accredited investors, thereby meaning they will no longer be able to participate in the new uh, regulatory compliant version of the Gladius ICO if they indeed decide to have one. So really, these regulations can kind of hurt more than help in some regards, but of course there are definitely situations where they help a lot more than hurt, especially with all the scams and slimy stuff stuff going on in the space. So with Microsoft entering into the ICO incubation game, that could very well help many individuals who want to do this right, want to do this above board, ultimately do so. So that's really cool. They're partnering with the Stratus platform, which is a platform that's been out for a number of years now and has a variety of various blockchain implementations for you to experiment on, including but not limited to Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Stellar Lumens. So you can kind of experiment and see how the stress test works and how the implementations on these various networks would perhaps shape up using the Stratus platform all in one convenient place, and now through Microsoft. Here's a funny quote from Adam Drapper. Um, I love this. Company, I have no product, but I'm raising $40 million. VCs, not interested, not interested at all but it's an ICO. Look, do you think you can make room for me and my team? And that's that's exactly what it felt like back in 2017. This is at the end of June 2017. Um, it very, very well encapsulates the, the zeitgeist of that era. Um, and it's kind of good to see we're moving away from that. But if you do want to launch an ICO, uh, again, none of this is financial advice, but seriously, regulatory compliance is the way to go. You don't want to skirt any edges um, or do anything not above board in that regard because you will get caught 99% certain. That's just kind of how this space works, especially if you're in a developed nation like the United States or uh, like Western Europe, for instance, Australia. You want to try and comply as much as you possibly can, um, considering a lot of this is legal gray area. You want to be in the safe side of things. So I wanted to go ahead and lay out a uh, group of other projects that allow you to launch ICOs either in fully regular regulatory compliant manners or in ways that you would maybe want to go and do your own due diligence in and ensure that in your jurisdiction you are compliant but nonetheless figured this would be a really cool chance to show you guys some of the options you have available to you in the space if you or your business or a business you're looking to start wants to launch their own fundraising again do your own research ensure you're regulatory compliant super important Komodo platform, in my opinion, and again, not financial advice, one of the biggest up and coming projects in the space. They have so much going on, not least of which is their decentralized ICO or DECO DAP, which allows for fully decentralized solutions for crowdfunding. This is probably the most dicey in terms of whether or not it's regulatory compliant. They have a barter dex, which is a decentralized exchange. So ultimately there is some gray area, but with that said, they have some really exciting technology, including cross chain atomic swaps. So neat stuff. Next up, we have the Ardor platform. Oh, looks like the Ardor platform is actually under maintenance. I was going to show you a bit about the child chains. Um, this is a perfect example, though. Ardor is just working tirelessly. They're one of the most undersung cryptocurrency projects in the space, as far as I'm concerned. They've been doing this for such a long time. They're a fork of NXT, uh, forked by the same company. Essentially, they did the first stable proof of stake uh, implementation in NXT, realized they can improve upon what they've already built, and decided to do an airdrop for all the individuals who already held NXT and created Ardor. Their child chain architecture is truly ingenious and solves scaling in a very, very elegant, yet seamless and functional way. Uh, for more information, you can check out the Ardor platform or head over to jellarita.com, their main website. 
Accelerita is the company that ultimately runs uh, the Ardor network along with the Ignis network, which is uh, intrinsically attached. Uh, really great for blockchain as a service business solution. So uh, for instance, if you're a real estate company or you already have a large business that you want to get on the blockchain and see if it fits right for you and your business, this is a good option. Additionally, another great option for an existing business is Stellar Lumens. Uh, They're fantastic. It allows for a lot of functionality, but it is more of a permission network. While Ardor is more permissioned and Komodo completely permissionless, Stellar Lumens is explicitly permissioned, uh, which means there's certain things you can do, certain things you can't do. However, there's much more uh, functionality on the network in terms of things you can do relative to what you can't do. Uh, but with that said, that is a consideration. Now, remember, Stellar Lumens was the first Sharia compliant blockchain. So in terms of global reach, Stellar Lumens may well be the leading competitor competitor in that regard. But of course, you can check out this link below in the description to get the whole documentation and see what may be the best fit for you, your business, or your future business that you're incubating and, and churning over, trying to get the best options here. And your buddy Paul, we're here to help. All right, Hyperledger. Hyperledger is perhaps one of the most well-known um, ecosystems. They are a very, very uh, permissioned version of a distributed ledger. If, it could even be, if, if they can even be called distributed, they handle all the consensus mechanism. Uh, but they allow you to build a top of their network. Um, it is a bit technical, so ultimately this would be something for like a large institution, maybe already a, a uh, technical um, organization that works in software, that sort of thing, because uh, it is it is a bit difficult to wrap your head around. There's a lot going on, and relative to some of these other more distributed platforms, I've heard it's not quite as exciting. This is outside of my area of expertise, though, because as said, this is largely an enterprise-level software uh, with a lot of implications. However, Amazon, they have listed Hyperledger as their first blockchain um, kind of consortium of services they're offering with the other coming down the pipe being the Ethereum network. So Hyperledger definitely has some huge names behind it and despite some of the technical difficulties definitely seems to have a strong future for existing businesses that don't want to dip their feet into the murky waters of distributed technology but rather want to swim in the crystal clear pool of innovation that is mostly permissioned specifically by the Linux Foundation as you can see up top here. So these are just four exciting ways you can launch your own project if you so desire but as said none of this is financial advice guys make sure you do your own research and always as always make sure you're regulatory compliant above board is better than in cuffs and that's really what we want to do here at cryptides make sure that you're doing your own research share with you relevant information and make sure you're safe here it's really important now next up we have uh speaking of safety i, I always hate this talk about stuff like this but I, I like to do it because i want to make sure that everyone out there understands what we're dealing with here Bitcoin traders, you guys got to be careful, okay? Anybody with crypto has to be careful. Those who don't know about it hear of the wild gains and it's oh, it's like digital gold. And, and unfortunately, the less um, savory characters out there are starting to pick up on the fact that this has value. And unfortunately, a group of robbers actually, it says gruesomely tortured, which is just disgusting, a Netherlands-based crypto trader. So really just, I, I wish nothing but, but well wishes to this guy. And for those who are apprehended and caught, you know, may they serve their time in the most horrid of conditions because, dude, dude, was essentially tortured now for his crypto, which is just horrible. We talk about decentralized technology and, and improving lives of people all around the world all the time, and this is not what we imagine at all. So luckily, these individuals uh, were apprehended. Um, they impersonated police knocking on this guy's door, uh, forced their way in. I mean, and as you can see from Whale Panda here, you know, you, you just want to make sure that you're okay with this kind of stuff. Uh, and and you're, if you're in a country where it is legal, of course, um, and if you have a family, um, firearms may go, be a good option, a deadbolt, that kind of thing. Or if you're in a country in which firearms are more heavily regulated, uh, then perhaps, like I said, bolting your door and just mostly doing, doing your own due diligence and just kind of uh, staying quiet about this kind of stuff. There's an old saying from World War II that loose lips sink ships, since sailors would talk about this, that, and the other, and perhaps divulge too much information unbeknownst to them. And sometimes, you know, we're used to being on the internet, we do a lot of blogging and talking and chatting like we're doing here, and unfortunately, sometimes individuals may be prone to release too much information, either about their personal finances, about their skills, or about their holdings. So ultimately, be safe out there, guys. Your buddy Pod loves you and cares about you, and we here at Cryptide only only want to spread love and happiness and especially knowledge and what better knowledge than to keep you and your loved ones and your financial future safe and secure. So with that uh, more somber point out of the way, I just wanted to cover that piece of news. Let's go ahead and move over to 
a more abstract component talking about NVIDIA and their shareholders. Uh, a, this is a great article. I actually tweeted this out on the Cryptide Twitter. Um, Nelson Rosario really knocked it out of the park with this one. Really, really great. Um, talking about how NVIDIA recently dipped their toes into the crypto market, wanted to build, of course, some ASIC miners, and they did very well during the 2017 bull run. However, things kind of took a sharp turn downward in 2018 throughout 2019. Um, and now one individual is launching a lawsuit. Specifically, it is a shareholder, shareholder lawsuit. Ultimately, what it allows this individual to do is, sh is sue on behalf of all NVIDIA holders, even if other NVIDIA holders are not actually suing the company themselves. And his argument is this, that they have breached fiduciary responsibility by putting too much stock into the crypto market and now their shares have taken a downturn, expected to drop at $2.7 billion in terms of revenue. Whoops, indeed. So with that said, uh, this is slowly working its way through the courts. We'll keep an eye on this and keep more information coming to you as things develop. But what do you guys think? Do you think this is a um, kind of a gamble for NVIDIA? Do you think it was just a blunder? Or maybe it was a, a breach of fiduciary responsibility? Or ultimately, perhaps this is a gamble that may pay off in their favor, considering, as we saw back here, institutional investors are beginning to keep a bigger eye on the space and perhaps ultimately will want to have some kind of hardware with which to participate in the great uh, potential next crypto bull run. After all, we've heard the sentiment kind of shift from 2014, 2015 with, man, will crypto survive? Man, just this crypto bear market's been really rough. I wonder what, what future place Bitcoin and crypto holds. To this, uh, this bear market has largely had the sentiment of, man, when will this bear market be over? Really looking for that next bull run. So it's exciting. We've really seen a paradigm shift in terms of how the space is viewed. And so perhaps NVIDIA may ultimately have a better legal footing because of that. But I'm curious what you think. Let me know below in the comments or hop over in the Discord and share some information because sharing is caring. And that's how we arrive at a closer understanding of objective reality through human dialogue. All right. Now, what else we got? Mistake or money laundering? Somebody sent a... 0 0.1, which is about 10 bucks, 15 bucks worth of Ethereum, and a $450,000 transaction fee. So that's like essentially sending a little teddy bear to your loved one and paying $450,000 in postage. It is just mind boggling. Uh, many individuals thought this is just a mistake, an honest mistake, as sometimes happens. It's called user error for a reason, and oh, if you want to talk about heartache. But strangely enough, it seems that this account sent more Ethereum from their from their address with transaction fees such such as 120,000, 60,000, and three or 30,000, excuse me, dollars for a total of 21,000 ETH. Uh, that was the $30,000 transaction fee. So yeah, wild stuff there. And some individuals are speculating this might actually be money laundering, since if you do not broadcast the transaction publicly, uh, a miner could actually quickly target that specific transaction, so it seems, and be able to uh, gain the benefit from that transaction fee. This would serve the additional benefit of further obfuscating from who this payment well, was from and where it was going to, specifically not as easily trackable on the network since it wasn't as uh, publicly broadcast uh, as normal Ethereum transactions are. So there is a lot of speculation as to what this may well be, uh, but there's one thing certain, there's a lucky miner out there who did hit the jackpot since not all of these uh, were not publicly broadcast. So some of these actually were publicly broadcast in mind. So some Ethereum miner out there is having a really, really good weekend. So cheers to that guy. Uh, and just to really, just wanted to cover this. This is a really interesting component of the space that uh, demonstrates there are some weird things that happen out there. And ultimately, not everything that occurs is at face value. So really neat. Next up, we have... Uh, I always like to look around. I'm always scared they're going to pop out of nowhere. The EOS crowd, I love them. I really do. Um, I, I give them a hard time, and they give me a hard time, because I made EOS Truth Reveal, that video series, that goes into many, many, many of the blunders that is the EOS network. Very poorly conceived, poorly contrived, centralized system, $4 billion ICO raise, far more than any other ICO in, in all of history. Uh, they still can't get it right, it seems. So I'm probably going to get some flack from that one, but that's okay. Um, so EOS is suffering from a 4 terabyte blockchain bloat problem. And this is from an EOS source, EOS Weekly. So yeah, go there. You go. See, so I'm not, I'm not just um, spreading fud or giving them unnecessary flack here. This is a legitimate issue. This guy is really he did a fantastic job with this. I mean, uh, just because you support a project that may be a bit more centralized or maybe we don't see eye to eye on, doesn't mean you have a gr doesn't mean you don't have a great head on your shoulders. There are brilliant people out there working on the EOS project and really upstanding characters in the space that are doing their absolute best to make it work. So don't get the wrong idea that I'm just trying to sling mud or anything like that 
since there are really brilliant folk out there working on this project. But nonetheless, one of the major issues in this project that's going to take all of their intelligence and perhaps some outside help to solve is this blow issue. Because there are no transaction fees on the network, the ultimate total size of data stored in the EOS blockchain system is going crazy. We're talking hitting new meteoric heights. Let me go ahead and dig through the video. I had it open. Uh, previously, but I had to refresh my page. Uh, here is an example of boom, the potential growth of the EOS network, which is huge. Bitcoins is very large, about 500 gigabytes, I believe was the total, but suffice to say that ultimately that's been going on for about yep, 500 gigs, 10 years. EOS has been going on for just over a year now, so it is a bit worrisome to see this meteoric rise. Furthermore, you do have some block producers that are ultimately some of the only individual block producers, some of which aren't even uh, actual BPs, they're on standby, that many of the dApps on EOS are referencing. So if one of these block producers go down, goes down, it's going to be very difficult for these dApps to continue running, and they're going to encounter some issues. So this goes back to the centralization issue that I talked about in the entire EOS series, in which you have certain individuals, uh, individual nodes in EOS that do a better job than others, ultimately leading to creeping centralization, meaning that you have centralized points of failure on the network. Whether that's good or bad, completely up to debate. Ultimately, for the size of the network, uh, doesn't seem to be boating too well. Definitely not something that we want to see occurring on any network, um, since considering X amount of years down the road, it's not going to be pretty, as you can see here from this still image. Uh, but great article, again, written by Omar Faridi. He always does great work, um, at least generally. I don't want to say always. There's always that caveat. Even I've made some horrible, horrible um, videos back in the day when I'm just starting out. You know, you're trying to feel out and, and, and do the best you can. But, you know, we don't have perfect information. But this article was really, really just like a uh, banging job. Great job, Omar. Um, and it really does a fantastic job laying out some of the points in the video. However, I recommend both reading the article and watching the video to get a better idea, uh, considering that EOS Weekly did a, some really great work here, great visuals, and it helps to drive the point home, and hopefully they can solve it. As I said, you know, I made some of the EOS folks salty, but I really do wish them the best, because if we all succeed, then we all win. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. Plenty of room in the crypto space for everybody. And instead of fighting over the same pieces of pie, let's put our heads together and make a bigger pie for everybody to enjoy. So with that said, that's all we have for you today, my dear user. Thank you so much for joining us. It is always a pleasure. Keep an eye out on Cryptide.cc. We have some very exciting tools coming down the pipe for you, including something that can up your trading game tremendously. I don't normally like to toot our own horn because we try to be humble here, but really, I haven't seen anything like this in the crypto space, so keep an eye out. With that said, my name is Paul. Thanks so much for watching, guys. We are Cryptide, and remember, the tide is rising as is the EOS transaction and block size. So hopefully you guys got some extra hard drives hanging up back.